Well, if you turn uh, again, please, to uh, Peter's first epistle, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, those first 12 verses uh, once again. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 to 12. And if you would pay particular attention, please, to verses, um, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9, our text for this evening. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect to exiles, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. May God add his blessing to a reading of his own infallible word. Well, verses uh, uh, 6 uh, through 9, our text uh, for this evening, uh, the pilgrim's triumph. Um, speaking briefly about the, um, you know, about the, the Trinity, as I, I mentioned last week, um, Peter and both Paul's, you know, um, mention of the Trinity. When you think about that, you know, they were, they were Jews, okay? And, of course, they would have been brought up with those verses from Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. The Lord your God is one. They were monotheistic, you know? And I don't know if you've ever wrangled with, if you've never... Um, you know, if you've never done business, try to evangelize a Muslim, you know. And of course, as soon as you start talking to them about the gospel, that's, the, that's where they go straight away, to the Trinity, you know. Uh, how, how can, you know, three persons, you're talking about three gods, you know. And, um, and maybe perhaps if you've had that experience, you come away from it. And you think to yourself, you know, you're beating yourself up and you think to yourself, you know, how could I not explain that better, you know? But you mustn't do that because they don't get it. They won't get it. They will never get it until they've been born again. 
till God switches that light on. It's only by faith that it's that, that you come to, well, not even fully then to understand it, but to receive it, to accept it as God's revelation of himself. But in dealing with them, monothe- mon- those who are monotheistic, Jews or, or, uh, or particularly Muslims I'm thinking about, like, you know, uh, one of the things that, well, two things that I do with them is I ask them, I say, well, do you believe that God is love? And of course, that's a no-brainer straight away. Yes, yes, of course we do. Of course we do, yes. Well, I say to them, well, before God created the world, who did he have to love if there's not plurality there? You see, in the Godhead between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is the covenant of love, infinite love. God is self-sufficient, self-existent. He had no need of us to love, you know? No, No need of anything or anyone. There was love there par excellence in the Godhead. And then, of course, I try to get them away from the Trinity and try to get them to their sin. I talked to them about their lusts, you know? How's your religion doing with your lusts? Because the religion just doesn't deal with that, like, and also it's getting them away from it really is, is, is the answer, you know. But anyway, that's just an aside. Uh, the pilgrim's triumph. The, the, the subject here is, is persecution. Peter's in a dungeon in Rome, soon to be martyred himself. Keep that in mind as we consider this uh, this evening, because... Um, this is coming from someone with the, the experience of the trials that he speaks of. Yeah? He's in a dungeon in Rome, and the letter comes to us through Sylvanus. We see at the end of the letter, he's the one who transports it from the dungeon, doubt, doubtless. And he brings it to the people of Asia Minor, who are likewise suffering under the governance of Nero, the Roman emperor, who is a fierce persecutor of Christians. And Peter is um, highlighting, if you like, um, the living hope that is ours by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, uh, our eternal security, seeking to drive that home. And of course, um, uh, this suffering was the norm, wasn't it? You know, from Pentecost, first of all, it was the Jews, and then, of course, Nero takes over, and he began, he began an opposition to the church that continued until Constantine in AD 300, almost. So, a necessary part of the pilgrim's lot, you see, suffering. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 it's given to you not only to believe on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ but to suffer for his sake Jesus he tells the disciples in John 16 in the world he says you will have tribulation but take heart I have overcome the world Paul he says through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12 talking to Timothy, just starting out in his ministerial career. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So it's pretty much the norm, you know. But however, as we contemplate what Peter tells us here, the inheritance that is ours, verse 5, this, Peter says, outweighs Well, the whole New Testament says, outweighs all the suffering that we may have to endure in this world. Our living hope, our inheritance is caused, no matter what we have to suffer in this world, is caused for us to rejoice with joy inexpressible in the midst of that suffering. As as a result of what will be the end, the goal of our faith, verse 9, even the salvation of your souls, says Peter. And what that produces, 
what the suffering produces as we go, as we trudge through this veil of tears. The sufferings that we endure, the trials, whatever they might be, they are sanctifying us, they are refining us, molding and shaping us into those living stones that he will talk about in chapter 2 to fit into God's house in that day. The Heidelberg Catechism, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, question one and its answer, the question is, what is your only hope in life and death? Only hope, only, yes, that I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation and therefore by his Holy Spirit he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Everything that falls out to you in this world is, as a believer, is subservient to your salvation. Works together for your good. Yeah? Yeah? So we've got three things here this evening. Verses 6 and 7, the trials, uh, the trust, verse 8, and the triumph, verse 9. The trials, verses 6 and 7. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation, the epiphany, the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now we behold his glory by faith in the word of God, but then we shall see him as he is. We shall behold his eternal glory. In, uh, in this, what? In this little while, in this little season, the events of history, all the events of history, your history, the history of the New Testament church, and all the trials that come within that little while, even the end of your faith, all the trials, it ends with verse 9, it ends in triumph, it ends in the salvation of your soul. The revelation, the full, the complete redemption, the whole thing. Yeah. Now, of course, in the midst of our trials, we're inclined to be fearful, especially when it's persecution, but we are commended here, Paul says, uh, Peter says rather, we're admonished in the midst even of fierce persecution to rejoice. It's unpleasant, it's terrible, we don't relish it, we fear it, but we are admonished here greatly and strongly by someone who's facing martyrdom. But of course, um, you know, this is, this is the very thing that the Lord Jesus Christ warned his disciples about about the, the persecution that was to come. Matthew 24, he says, For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. But we need to focus on this verse 9, the end of our faith, the big picture, the temptations, the trials, the tests of our faith, 
They're not solicitations to evil, to sin, but of course they can become that if we don't handle, if we don't deal with them in the right way. Because we're ever tempted, are we not, in the face of trials, when difficulty, co when difficulty comes, whether it's affliction or whether it's persecution, the temptation is ever and always there to deny our faith and even maybe like Peter of old to deny that we even know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the temptation. That's where the temptation to sin comes. Because we've got, you know, we've got lives to preserve, you know, and we've got livelihoods to preserve you know, and, and uh, family maybe, you know, and, and our homes and such like. Um, I mean, even, the, even in the present circumstances, you know, maybe at work, you know, in your place of employment, a uh, conversation arises as to, you know, the beginnings of, of the world, you know? And, uh, well, well, what do you think as a Christian, you know? And the temptation is there, you know, the, the controversy there and the, the temptation is, is, is to dan deny what you, what you really believe, that God in six days created the heavens and the earth. And then, of course, when it spins into the business of the sexuality. The temptation is there, is it not, to remain silent, to say nothing. In my work on the streets, I'm faced with this continually. It's been brought up um, day after day. Um, the, the business I mean about the, the, the sexuality. And um, well, I mean, you could take the attitude, you could say, well, well, don't talk about these things. Don't, don't preach on that. I mean, for instance, the organization, the, the open, open Air Mission that's there, their policy is, don't, don't talk about that. But has that been faithful to the Lord? Isn't that a predominant sin in our society, in our Western world today? Is that, is that honoring to the Lord? Well, well I, I, I don't think so. Some while back, um, uh, I was here you had uh, Professor Palmer Robertson preaching for you. And he and I bumped into each other out there in the foyer. And when he heard that I was a street preacher, he asked me the question. He said, he said, do you preach against homosexuality? I said, yes, I do, sir. Frequently. And I told him why. I was in Stafford one Friday afternoon preaching. And I read from the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where you get a catalog of sins, including homosexuality. And I preached from that. And as I came to a, an end, I, um, I read the passage again. And over to my right, there was a young couple, about maybe 19, 20, they stood over to my right. And as I came to a conclusion, they came walking towards me. And the young man, he said to me, excuse me, he said, are you telling me, he says, that homosexuals are excluded from God? I said, no, I said, I'm not telling you that. He said, but God is. And he turned to the young woman who was with him, his words, not mine, he turned to her and he said to her, his face was fallen, he was crushed. He turned to her and he said, then he says, I'm screwed. I said, wait a minute, young man, wait a minute. I said, um, let's read the passage again. I said, and take note of how it finishes. And such were some of you. I said, some of these Christians were homosexuals amongst other things. But they were washed, they were cleansed, they were justified before the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, there's a way back, there's a way out of it. And we had a very interesting conversation. 
Uh, the end of it was he took a, new, a copy of the New Testament. I highlighted the verses for him. I told him to go home and meditate on them. And he went away with the New Testament. If I had not been there and if I had not preached on that subject, that man who needed to hear those words would not have heard them. We don't preach it because we hate them. We preach it because we love them and we want them to be saved from it. But you see, the temptation is don't talk about it. Say nothing. Deny uh, maybe the Lord even. So, um, you know, it's um, when it comes to persecution, the persecution that Peter's talking about here, I mean fierce persecution. The world's hostile against us and, and you know, um, former friends turn against you, uh, employers um, cancel your contracts, you know, and, and such times as that you see, well, our churches will have to have a very, a very real and serious diaconate. Yeah? Family members, family members will be disowning us. Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And, um, and then, of course, you see their real hatred now they say to you, no, we, we don't hate God. But then, of course, their hatred will be seen. The hostility, the cruelty will be revealed. But now, says Peter, he says, for a little season, just for a little while. But then, verse 9, the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. A little while, maybe even a lifespan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for this light momentary affliction, says Paul, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. A light momentary affliction, it sure doesn't feel like that, Paul. My 77 years is like a heartbeat from God's perspective. Just a moment. But rejoice. Rejoice, says Peter, because of what lies at the end of it. Yes, weep, cry. But through the tears, let your smile, joy be seen. Because during that little while, your faith is being tested, which is much more precious than gold or silver. When you put the gold, the silver, into the furnace, you know, if it melts, well, it's not the real thing. It's not the real deal. Your faith is what you believe concerning God's word and your act of believing. And of course, there's ever, there's always the counterfeit. There's the historical faith. There's the, the temporal faith, you know. Um, the parable of the sower, you know. Along comes some kind of offense because of the word of God and this person is gone. Your faith being tested, more precious than gold, being tested, shows, you see, that when you come through, you come out the other end still believing you are the genuine, the real article. And of course, true faith binds us, unites us to Jesus Christ inseparably. And the more and more we sink into him, the more and more we are protected. 
The fire will not destroy us. It will just simply and only refine us, purify and strengthen better than gold. Yeah? During this quarantine time, I've been doing a, a, a catechism class on social media, video like, you know. And I did one on Friday on, on the question, can a true believer uh, fall from a state of grace? And a man came back with the question, he said, he said, what do you think, he said, if, let me suppose he says that, that you've, You've been born again, you've been justified, you've been adopted, you tick all the boxes. But he said, um, towards the end of your life, you get sick. He said, you're in the hospital, he says, and the doctor says there's no cure for you. He says, you're in agony, you're in great pain. And the doctor says to you, look, I can give you an injection and just finish it all. He said, and you say, okay, do it. He says, you're going to hell. So, it's a good question, but he obviously wasn't listening to what I said in the video. <laughs> but, so I said, I said it again, you know, I, I said, look, I said, um, I said, you know, listen to the words again. I said, there's nothing. There's nothing can separate me from the love of God in Jesus Christ. I said, I, I do not want to face circumstances like that. And if I ever do, I hope that God would give me the grace to say to the doctor, no, most definitely not. I said, but if the doctor goes ahead and does it, I said, that's on him. If a family member gives them the, the permission to do it, that's on them. That's not on me. But even were I to succumb, I said, there is nothing. I said, you're not understanding the covenant of grace. You're not understanding justification. The true believer is justified unto all eternity. And there is nothing, Romans 8 again, verses 35 and following, there's nothing in heaven, on earth, in hell, nothing that can separate the true believer from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Nothing. But then, with these trials, you know, maybe somebody would say, well, you know, this, all this, this suffering, you know, um, trials um, uh, and temptations and, and you know, um, well, do I really, do I really want that, you know? And I, here I am, I, I'm quite content, I'm quite happy in the world, you know, and, and Things are going well for me uh, at the moment. Well, let me urge you, please, to think on the big picture. Yeah? You look at the church maybe in a time of decline. It's backs against the wall and severely being persecuted. And you think to yourself, I don't need any of that. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, you do. Because what you need to do is you need to think of the big picture. You need to think of the end game. Yeah? Because you see, the church wins in the end. The Christian, the true believer, may suffer, may, may be persecuted, may even face martyrdom like the apostle Peter. But the end, the end of their trial, the end of their suffering is eternal glory. Verse 9, the salvation of their souls. So I would urge such a person, I would, I would urge them to think of their relationship with eternity. Not just this world, not just time. To think of, their, think of your, your relationship to God as it is outside of Jesus Christ now. Wrath hangs over you like the sword of Damocles waiting to fall upon you and the suffering, suffering that believers go through in this world in time is nothing in comparison with the suffering that you will have to endure in hell. 
And so I urge you, I would urge you to seek the Lord. I would, I would urge you th to, to this very night to go to Jesus Christ, to receive Jesus Christ. Many are called, says Jesus, but few are chosen. Don't let that be an excuse. I have a friend, a very dear friend, who does that very thing. She says, I don't think I'm chosen. Yeah, that's an excuse. Many are called. You are called. You are being called here tonight. Jesus Christ is calling you tonight. Repent and believe the gospel, he says to you. You're being called. And he's calling you seriously. He's not mocking you. You come to him, you will not be turned away. No one in hell will ever say, I went to Jesus and he rejected me. No one. Think of the Canaanite woman. She comes to Jesus and Jesus doesn't pay any attention to her. And even his disciples, they say to him, Lord, tell this woman, go away. She's mithering us, you know. And then Jesus gives her two reasons why he shouldn't, he shouldn't fulfill her request. She says, yeah, she says, I'm a, I'm a dead dog of a sinful woman lying under your table. But she says, I ain't going nowhere till you give me what I'm wanting. And she got it. That's how you seek him. You go and you ask and ask and ask. You knock and knock and knock until he opens the door. You, 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 you take the kingdom by violence, a holy violence, you knock on his door, but if he doesn't open, you, you kick the door open. Don't take no for an answer. There's a man, evening service, going out the door, he said to the minister, he said, sir, he said, do you think, he said, if I was to die tonight, do you think I would go to heaven? And the minister said to him, honestly, he said to him, to be honest, he says, I, I really don't have that conviction, no. And the man, instead of getting angry, instead of getting a huff, he went home. And he got on his knees. And he cried all night long. And just as the dawn broke, Jesus came to him and gave him a pardon. He was reborn. So don't waste any more time or raise any more excuses. You go to Jesus. He will not turn you away. Yeah. Trust, verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice. With joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. As we contemplate being with the Lord, seeing, beholding his glory in our Father's house, because that's the ultimate, isn't it? Paul, he says in um, Philippians 1, verse 23, he says, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to, be, is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. That's the ultimate. separated now but we long for him we long for him to come to his church again don't we but we long for him to come we, we long for the, the unveiling of the son of God but in the meantime while we groan while we wait we can rejoice because of this great salvation our comfort, our consolation in the midst of this veil of tears, even, even in the face of the certainty of death. Yeah. 
Peter's not trying to put more fear into them. He's, try, he's driving home the fact of their eternal security. There's nothing that can touch them. They're indestructible. But how do you say, how, how, can we, how can we love him when we've not seen him? I mean, I, I love my wife. But I, I, I see her, I see her every morning. I, I, I hear her voice every day. You know, but Jesus, he's in heaven, he's out of sight. I can't see him, but still, you see, we love him because we have his letter, yeah? The Bible's a, a love letter, his love letter to his people by which he guides us, assures us, comforts us, consoles him. It's there, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, it's there that we see him, but like in a mirror. Yeah. But we see him, we see him, we behold his glory here in the scriptures. Here we hear his voice. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. I hear of these people, you know, they, they, they say, apparently they say, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but, you know, I, I don't need all this doctrine stuff. I don't need to be reading the Bible all the time and coming to church every single week, you know. That's like me, you know, that's like me saying to my wife, Ness, look, hey, I love you very much, but please, I don't want to see you no more, and I don't want you talking to me anymore. <laughs> guess, how, guess how that would work. <laughs> so we express our love for him how? By loving his word, by feeding on his word day by day, by loving his people, loving one another. By building his house, you know, keeping his worship pure, by, by sanctifying ourselves every Saturday evening, ready for the coming Sabbath day. You know that we are, we are wholly given over to seeking the Lord on the Sabbath day without any distractions. That's how we express our love to him and obedience to him. But of course, we love him only because he first loved us. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Romans 5, verse 5, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. 1 John 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And for us to taste, to taste his love. Believing, trusting in the midst of these trials. Believing constantly, going on believing. It's a participle, you know, it's believing. Constantly putting our trust in and into him because faith, it's the faith you see that that makes the bond that unites us to Jesus Christ in an inseparable union. And the power that uh, convicts us, assures us that we belong to him. It's not just simply our acceptance of propositions. It is that, but it's much, much more than that. It's a living, it's, it's a personal friend who's with you in all those various trials. Think of Daniel, um, you know, in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar's there on the outside, and he says to one of his henchmen, did we not put three men into that furnace? And his henchman turns to him and says, yes, yes, sir, we, we put three men in. Well, why, he says, do I see four? One like a son of man. Because Jesus was in the fire with them. 
I will never leave you or forsake you in the darkest and the fiercest trial, in the worst affliction that you can imagine, even on that sick bed in agony and the doctors the, the doctors wanting to put you down, even there, I've got you by the hand. I'm with you. But that time is coming, of course, when we'll be reading his love letter no more, because we shall behold him. We shall see him face to face. Behold his glory. And so we can rejoice. And rejoice intensely, says Peter. A joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Because of the glory that awaits. Uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, not cursed, not because God's displeased with you, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. Beyond utterance, a weight of glory when you're tried, when you're tempted, when you're afflicted, when you stand in the fire, there's an eternal weight of glory is laid upon you. Yeah. Thirdly, the triumph, verse 9 obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, the end, the goal, the destination, this is where we're going, where we're heading, the victory, the triumph for the people of God, obtaining that which our faith now hopes for, that we have now in principle, but then shall have in all its reality. Again, Romans 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Sufferings again, see? Knowing that the, that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to We still live in these bodies of death. The remaining corruptions, you know, under the, under the effects of the curse, the entire creation does. Groaning, waiting for that day of redemption. Now we suffer, now we are persecuted, now we are despised, now we are afflicted, we are tried. But just, in a little while, it'll be gone. It'll be all over. And God himself will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Yeah? And you will receive the gift. The gift. It's grace, you see? It's all grace, beginning to end. The salvation of your soul. Um, Paul talks of this, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13, because of him, God that is, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. You didn't put yourself there. Yeah? You didn't work yourself into that place. God himself put you there in Christ. Okay? Who became to us wisdom from God, not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom that leads to salvation. Righteousness, that's our justification. That's our rightness with God, justified by his, by the, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. 
He has cleared us in, in the court of heaven. The moment that we believed in Jesus, God the judge donned the judge's cap, he brought down the gavel, and he declared not just innocent, not just not guilty, but righteous, justified unto all eternity, just as though you had never ever sinned in all your existence. He looks on you, he looks on Israel, and he sees no sin. Not at all. Righteousness, sanctification, he separated us from the world. He separated us from our old worldly lifestyle and course. He separated us from the world. He separated us to himself, made us his very own possession. And he is, through these trials that we face, he is sanctifying us, honing us, refining us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Redemption. That's the whole nine yards. That's the whole thing from beginning to end. The redemption that Jesus Christ accomplished, the God-man. The mediator sent from heaven, appointed, anointed of his Father to to accomplish our mediation, our reconciliation to God. Through his death on the cross, his resurrection, his reigning and ruling at the right hand of God, interceding for us at the right hand of God now, the whole thing finished. God has made Christ to us redemption. The whole thing is ours. So what, so what can anybody say? Huh? What then shall we say, says Paul, Romans 8? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for you, who can be against you? King Nero? Huh? The United Nations, the United States of Europe... Uh, if the whole world is against you, if God is for you, who can be against you? But if God's against you, but you're in trouble, who have you got going for you? Nero, the world, the devil will all rage against us. Sometimes it will be worse than others. But God is for us. We are, in, we are untouchable. We are indestructible. I think it was Mr. Whitfield says that a believer is indestructible until he or she's work on this earth is done. You see, we have a covenant of grace. It's a covenant that's sure, as sure as sure can be. It's a covenant that was formed by God. It was established by God with us. And it's even unilateral. It's kept by God because we can, because we're all covenant breakers. So he has to keep it. It's inviolable. It's unbreakable. Take note, will you, of those, that phrase. In the Old Testament, you see at times you find Israel's in trouble for one reason or another. Gotten herself into trouble and, 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 and you see this phrase time and again. And God remembered his covenant. He can't, he can't deny himself. 
He can't go back in his own word. He will not. Yeah. Even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. And so he shall, child of God, he shall save you, deliver you, and you shall receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. But of course, dealing with that question, may a true believer fall from a state of grace? I did mention that, you know, that um, some people would say, well, in that case, it doesn't matter how I live. I can live as I please. Well, anybody, I would suggest, anybody who, who has that notion, who, who can who can understand the gospel in this way and take that notion away from it. I wonder really if they truly know God, if they understand what it is that God has done for them. This is an incitement. This is our motivation to please him. As the Heidelberg Catechism says in its answer, the Holy Spirit assures us of eternal life and makes us sincerely willing to live unto him. Not to ourselves anymore. That's how we lived in times past, not now. We live to God and to his glory. We want to please him in everything that we do. So I think that what Peter is doing is he's setting our expectations, you know, reality. You know, th this, this is the reality. This, this is the Christian life. No, it's not a bed of roses. That comes later on. And so I think what Peter would have us to do is to have our expectations realistic so that we are not led to disappointment so that we understand what it is that we are entering into what we have gotten into and that, that there will be times when iniquity will abound and, and, and the hearts of many will grow cold because of it and there will be times when the church is on the back foot and times of severe persecution even. Well, why does Peter, why does Peter tell us these things? To cause more fear? No. But to prepare us so that we will be true soldiers of Jesus Christ and willing to endure hardships like good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Isaiah says, chapter 43 and verse 2, he says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Lions den again. Fiery furnace again. But notice, when you pass, not if. When you go through the waters, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the waters shall not overflow you. Isaac Watts says in his hymn, Are we the soldiers of the cross? the followers of the Lamb, and shall we fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? No. We shall not be ashamed of the gospel of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wait for his coming, as we look at the big picture, as we see the end, the end of our faith, that which we live for, that which we hope for, that, that living hope, as we patiently, in faith, wait for him. 
in the direst, in the darkest times. Because whatever you go through, whatever affliction comes to you, and isn't it the case, beloved, isn't it the case, when trouble comes, huh? we think, he doesn't love me anymore. Huh? When the clouds come, maybe, maybe even we've caused the clouds ourselves. And we begin to think, he doesn't love me like he used to do. No, no, no. His love, I tell you, in the direst affliction, in the darkest time that you could possibly ever go through. And remember I told you, yeah, that, that his love has not shifted one degree, not one iota. From the moment he set his love upon you, it remains steadfast and sure, the love of the Lord the one thing that you can guarantee. You're in the hands of the Savior and you're in the hands of the Father and no one but no one shall take you, pluck you from their hands. He has given you eternal life and you shall never perish. And tonight if you hear his voice, if you hear his call, if you hear the whisper of his name, if he calls you, whatever he, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Trust. Only believe. Read the Gospels. Men and women, time and again, they come to Jesus with all kinds of problems, all kinds of trouble, and the answer is given the same each and every time. Trust in God. Only believe. Think of the man who came to Jesus with his, with his son full of evil. Lord, if you can do anything, anything to help us, please. Jesus answers him in effect this way. What do you mean? What do you mean can I do something to help you? That's not the question. Can you believe? That's the question. Lord, he said, help my unbelief. Can you? Will you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Then you shall be saved. Everlasting life. And obtain the end of your faith. The salvation of your souls. Amen.